verses 12 through 17, a letter to God's children. A letter to God's children. Notice what John writes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known Him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I bring to you, fathers, because you have known Him that is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Last week we learned that we were to walk in imitation of Christ's walk. We are to walk in obedience to God's commandments. We are to walk in truth. We are to walk according to the word and teachings that we heard at the beginning of our Christian experience. We are to walk in self-sacrificing humility. But above all, we are to walk in love. We are to walk in love. For God is love. And the two great commandments is to love God and love your neighbor. John in the passage before us writes a letter commending the believers for their walk in the Lord and exhorting them to continue their walk just as they had from the beginning. Here's the truth. Believers who follow the will of God are promised eternal life. This is the will of God. Amen. If you don't know what God's will is, I, I, was, I was so touched by a precious lady way in her 80s. And she asked one day, very honestly, pray that I might know the will of God. And that tells me that she had not come to that place in her spiritual experience that she knew that the Bible is the will of God for every believer. Amen? When we think about will of God, too often time, we think about what our purpose is. What is my purpose? But that's in God's will, not this is the will of God. Every one of us knows what the purpose of God is for our life. When we come to Christ, we're called to be witnesses. That's God's will for our life. Amen? So we already know the will of God. We really don't need to pray about it. We just need to do it. <laughs> Amen? We just need to read the Bible. We need to get along with God and the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, illuminate this Word of God. Show me what it means. Show what it means in truth and show what it means to me and how I can apply it to my life. You see, this is a living word. It's not like a book you pick up and you lay down and you walk away from it. You can read Moby Dick. I wouldn't advise it, but you could. That's a thick book. And it's real boring because I had to read it when I was in school. <laughs> Amen. But you put, you put it aside and it hadn't changed your life. Now our teacher, when I was at school, tried to say, now what is the message of Moby Dick? What does the well represent? That's a white well. What does Ahab represent? Why is Moby Dick? And of course at that time I was a little smarter than I should have been. I said it's a fish story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she didn't laugh. <laughs> but I couldn't tell you everything about Moby Dick now. But when I knew this word, and this word is alive and it's changing my life, I can show you where this word has changed me, has changed my life, has changed people around me, changed other people. Because this is a living word. 
This is the Word of God, breathed by the Spirit of God. It's not written by just a man. But holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. They were anointed of the Spirit. Now let me tell you this. Spiritual inspiration is different from human inspiration. Spiritual inspiration comes divinely from God. And it can reveal to you knowledge and wisdom that you would not ordinarily know. I remember years ago, and I was in a church, and there was this evangelist. Now this evangelist said he had certain knowledge. God would give him a word of knowledge. And uh, most of you knew Pop. Pop was a very private man. Well, he called him up. And he says, the Lord tells me you've got a kidney problem. Now, I don't know whether he told Mom or not. But I do know it touched his heart. And he saw it was from God because he hadn't told anybody else. God had revealed it to him. And he allowed the man to pray for him. There's knowledge sometimes that God gives us. You know, you talk about those premonitions. Premonitions may just be warnings from God. When you feel that bad thing about you should, you know, you're planning a, a trip somewhere and suddenly it doesn't seem right. It don't fit right. Things begin to happen and it doesn't seem like you're ever going to get away. And God might be saying to you, you need to replan the plan. Amen? Because God's already out there. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. God is in the past. God is in the present. God is in the future. Amen? God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. That's why you can be sure if you're walking with God... God already has grace and mercy and peace and comfort to give you tomorrow because He knows what you're going to face. He knows whether you're going to face a victorious day where you go throughout the day skipping if you still skip. <laughs> Rejoicing. Or He knows there's going to be a problem. And He's already got the grace and the mercy and the Spirit of God to comfort you because He knows what you have need of when you need it. Amen? Amen. Corey Ten Boom once said to her dad, and Corey Ten Boom was a Holocaust victim. And uh, God saved her through the Holocaust. She lost her sister Elizabeth in one of those camps. She died while in the camp, and Corey came out. Corey Ten Boom. And she said to her dad one time, she said, Dad, I don't understand grace. You just keep talking to me about grace. Tell me what is grace. I need grace to abide under this Nazi regime. I need grace every day. What is that, God? I, what do I need? And he said, Corey, it's like this. When do I give you the train ticket? Do I give it to you a week before? A day before? Or when you get on the train? She says, Daddy, you give me the ticket when I get on the train. He says, that's what God does. You don't need the grace this week. You don't need the grace the day before. You need it when you're right in the midst of the fire. Amen. You need it when you're in that den of lies. Amen. You need it when all the world's upside down and you feel tossed in to and fro. That's when you need grace. And you need mercy. And God says, if you'll just call upon me. My ears are open to the cries of the righteous. Amen. God says, I've got an answer on the way. Just ask for it. And then He reminds us, we have not because we ask not. I guarantee you, that's why it means that we need to be like little children. You know how your children are? 
They want something they don't back up. Mommy, I need this. Daddy, I need this. Mama, Daddy, let me have this. Let me have this. They ain't shy. <laughs> Amen? Well, you shouldn't be shy with God. Father, I need this. Father, I need strength for today. Father, I need mercy right now. Father, I need the comfort of the Holy Spirit in my life. Or simply, Lord, I just need to have my needs supplied. Amen? But you don't get it unless you ask for it. So let's see the instructions that John gives. He says, remember, your sins are forgiven. Wonderful. John writes the church as the children of God. He says, children of God, remind you that your sins are forgiven because of the work of Christ. Boy, that ought to get you up every morning and say, thank God my sins are forgiven. Amen. Thank God. They're put as far from me as the east is to the west. Thank God. He said he put it between his shoulder blades. Thank God. And I want to tell you, ain't nobody seen what's between your shoulder blades. Thank God he put it in the sea of forgetfulness, non-remembrance. To be remembered against you no more. Amen. So, we ought to rejoice and be happy. Amen. That our sins are forgiven. The blood and bulls of goats could not do it. It could only atone for our sins. And next year, we'd have to get another goat. We'd have to get another sheep. We'd have to get a turtle dove. We'd have to have some flour. And every year we had to do it. But now, you come to Jesus. You ask Him to forgive your sins. He not only atones for it, He's paid for it and He takes it away. Amen. Amen. It's wiped away. Those blots of transgression against you, God has wiped away. You stand before the Lord in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You stand before the Lord white and holy before Him through Jesus Christ. So He says, remember that. Remember that. Why? Because He knows you're going to face the enemy. He knows that hard times are coming. He knows that in this world you shall have trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now notice here. Remember your walk in the Lord. Don't just remember that your sins are forgiven. But some of us who are older in the Lord, we need to remember our walk and how we got here. Amen? Some of you who are young in the Lord, you need to remember when you came to Jesus, that night you accepted Him and how the walk's been since then. Amen? Because as you remember the walk, you remember the joy, you remember the peace, you remember the closeness and love of God. Amen? Folks, I love to think back about the walks that I had with my daddy in the woods. I don't get to see him no more. But I can see him in my memories. And the walks we had. And the instructions he gave. Amen. The walks I had with my mama. I don't have her no more either. But I remember the walks. <laughs> I remember the times we were alone to where I could say she was my best friend. Amen. I remember the walks. One thing I remember a lot better than that. I remember my walk with the Lord Jesus. And we've walked in some light paths, Sister Jan. And we've walked in some dark paths. We've walked in some times where we were on the mountaintop. And we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But I'm standing here today to tell you after 50 years of preaching this gospel, He has never failed me yet. <laughs> Amen. He always answers the prayer. He's always there. Amen. Amen. Even when my daddy rejected me and told me when I went to Bible college, if I went that day, I wouldn't have a mama or a daddy or a home to come to. And I said, I got to go. That's what I told him, wasn't it? And he took it wrong. 
Because I took it as an attack from Satan. I said, I can't say, have some old devil tell me I can't go to school. And he took it personally. And I wouldn't call him an old devil. I told him, I said, Daddy, I didn't call you an old devil. But your words were an attack from Satan to me, and I had to leave that day. I couldn't not leave that day. And so what I was saying was, I couldn't let the enemy keep me from going to Bible college. It paid off. Because after a while, they got to missing old Walker. <laughs> and Daddy would write the letter and say, Walt, come home. Your mama wants to see you. He was a man. Men don't show affections in those days. And I wrote him back. What home? You told me I didn't have a mama, a daddy, and a home. What home are you talking about? You see, I had been to the prayer room below the chapel in Lee College. And I had got along with God. And I had cried and whined before the Lord. And said, Lord, I don't have a home. I don't have a daddy. I don't have a mama. And it's like the Lord spoke to me out of heaven and said, as long as you walk with me, son, you'll always have a father. And I've always had a father in heaven. Weeks went by and he said, son, you got a home? Come on back. Your mama's missing you. So I wrote him again. I said, well, Daddy, remember you told me I didn't have a home and I didn't have a mama and I didn't have a daddy. I said, until I hear from you that you want me to come home and that I have a mama and a daddy and a home to come to, you'll never see me again. Next week, they didn't take the next week, Son, come on home. You got a daddy. <laughs> you got a mama. You got a home. And ten years later, he came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You got to stick your guns. You got to remember the walk from where God has taken you and where has God put you aside to talk to you and to love you and to comfort you and to strengthen you. And when you remember that walk, I want to tell you, there's not enough devils in hell to make you go the other direction. Amen. Amen. When you walk with God and you know that all you got to say, Lord, send some angels. Boom! God sends some angels to help you. Amen. God, I'm in trouble. I need your help. I know you're in trouble and I'm on the way. <laughs> Amen. So he says, remember your walk. John writes to the fathers, the young men and children, because they know God and they have overcome the devil. Amen. Now he repeats this fathers, young men, and children, and also particular fathers and young men. But he assures them that in spite of the rigorous tests contained in the letter, he's confident that they're going to keep saved. I mean, they're going to keep their salvation. Now we need to remember, when he used fathers, young men, and children, he's describing the levels of spiritual maturity. He's talking about fathers in the world. He's talking about young men in the Lord. He's talking about children in the Lord. So he's talking about the spiritual maturity. And that's so in the church. We have fathers in the Lord. In fact, in the black church, they have what they call mothers in Israel. And there's a, there's a set of women that sits on one side of the church. And they're the mothers in Israel. And then on the other side of the church is the deacons. So they got fathers and mothers in the Lord. Now we don't practice that in evangelical churches. Black churches practice that. But we do have fathers in the Lord. We do have mothers in the Lord. <coughs> I remember two mothers in the Lord. Sister Robbie Howard and Sister Vince. I want to tell you when I came to that church in uh, Warner Robins, Georgia, I had two prayer warriors. And when I went away to Bible college, I know I had two prayer warriors. That was looking after me in prayer. Amen. I'd come home and uh, you'd have to know Sister Vincent. <laughs> she was not that that affectionate a woman. But somehow she fell in love with me. Sister Howard was a praying woman. And I knew I had two mothers in Israel. 
two mothers. I can count them. You need to do that. You need to find those fathers in the Lord. Those men who are godly men who are showing example the way godly men are supposed to be. And you need to have those older in the Lord. It doesn't accord to age. It's according to maturity in the Lord that you have that you can say, I can call that person. They'll talk to God and God will hear. I have that kind of confidence. Why do we need that? Because there's times we can't pray like we need to pray. And we need to know we can reach out to somebody that can pray and touch God for us. The wicked one whom they have overcome, it refers to the devil. They've overcome Satan. John writes to the fathers and young men because the fathers have known Christ from the beginning. The young men are strong. They have the indwelling word and they've overcome the devil. When we begin to understand the fathers, he said they've known him from the beginning. This is a reference back to the apostles, the disciples from Jerusalem, from the crucifixion of the Lord. In John's time. In our time was those that when we come into the church, we see those older saints. They are the ones that have walked the path, have kept the church going. Amen? And then we have to realize that we have the responsibility as young people to keep the church going. Amen? If you don't have young people in a church, you've got a dying church. Amen? Young people tell you that there's life and that the church will continue on. Finally, we need to remember to separate ourselves from the world and hide ourselves in Christ. Notice what? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that hasn't changed through Adam's time. John, or Adam, saw an apple that was looked good to eat, the lust of the flesh. Then, the lust of the eyes, he saw was, was beautiful, and he wanted it. And the pride of life. The devil told him the moment she needed this, she could be like God. So his pride came up. I'll be like God. And he ate of the apple and transgressed God. That has not stopped. Man still has the lust of the flesh. Man still has the lust of the eyes. And man still has the pride of life. When we talk about love, nothing to do with the world. For if we love the world, we are absent of God's love. Now the world is not the world of people as seen in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Or the created world as seen in John 17.24. This world is passing away. It is the world or realm of sin as seen in verses 16 and James 4, 4, which is controlled by Satan and organized against God and righteousness. It's the evil world, he says, to separate ourselves from. The world of sin. The world consists of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, which are not of the Father, but are of this world. This sin-contaminated world. The lust of the flesh is the cravings of sinful man which have their basis in our sinful nature. It's why our sinful nature tells us we want. We, we strive after. We desire. Remember saying the love of money is the root of all evil? Didn't say money was the, was the root of all The love of money. That lust for money. Got to have it. The lust of the eyes often leads to greed and covetousness which desires what others have. You see, it's one thing to see something somebody has and say, might I like to have that? That's all right. Covetousness is when your mind begins to turn and you begin to figure out a way how you can get it, how you can steal it, how you can make it yours. The same way when a man covets another man's wife, he tries to figure out ways how he's going to get that woman. They don't belong to him. But covetousness pushes him forward. It's like that person who sees that boss and he wants that boss's position and he's going to do anything he can to undermine that boss so he can get that position. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
Pride of life is boasting, vain glory, or to displaying or boasting about one's possession. That's like they say to these people who, men over 40 go out and buy these sports cars. That's vain glory. They want to show people, look what I got. Amen. You know what I like about uh, Billy Graham? Billy Graham's uh, ministry brings in millions of dollars. But Billy Graham decided to live in the same old farmhouse that he was raised in and take care of the property. Billy Graham chose to drive a modest car. Not a Lamborghini. Not a Corvette. He had regular faucets in his house. Not like some televangelists who have had gold faucets in their house. In other words, what we're saying is, the pride of life is look at me. You know? I don't mind going around in, in, in overalls. I don't have to wear a suit. Amen. I don't wear a suit to say, look at me. I wear a suit because it's kind of like if I was in another church, I'd have a rope on. Amen. But there are some people, this suit, by the way, is not even close to $1,000. But I know some people that won't have a suit unless it's $1,000. Won't have shoes unless they paid several hundred dollars for them. The pride of life. Boasting. Vain glory. Well, John says, the world and its lust are passing out of existence, but those who do the will of God live forever. Doing the will of God is the opposite of loving the world. I want to tell you, the more you do the will of God, the more you're going to hate this world. And the more you're going to pray Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. Folks, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Amen. God has prepared us a mansion in heaven. Amen. Amen. I ain't never lived in a mansion. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do in a mansion. <laughs> I mean, we got two bathrooms in our house, and sometimes I don't know what to do with two bathrooms. <laughs> I used to have a bath and a path. <laughs> But we were uptown because we had two holes. <laughs> Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but I do remember the wire thing that you hung the Seals Roebuck catalog on. <laughs> and the red corn cobs and the white corn cobs. <laughs> oh, Lord. My boys asked me <laughs> one day, said, Daddy, <laughs> Did you have TV when you was coming up? I said, no, we painted on the walls of caves when I was coming up. <laughs> yes, we had <have> television. <laughs> but the remote control was me and my brothers. Dad said, go out and turn the antenna, boys. <laughs> we had three stations. I didn't have TV. You didn't have that either. <laughs> oh, Lord. And now people have a problem because they can't program their remote. There's still an R and O button, folks. There's still a channel button. You don't really need that remote. <laughs> but it's easy. It's easy. Doing the will of God proves the possession of eternal life and of living forever. Amen. When we're doing the will of God, we are proving to the world I have eternal life. That I'm a child of God. Amen. And we're not ashamed. Amen. I'm not ashamed when somebody don't like it because I'm a Christian. Say, man, I've got a better way for them. And if my better way gets under their skin, I hope it gets into their heart. Amen? Because if I can get under your skin, by and by I'll get in your heart with Jesus. Amen? Conclusion. The character of our conduct is the imitation of Jesus Christ. The commandment of our conduct is separation. The children are to be holy and separate themselves from sin and the world. Those who do prove that they are born again and possess eternal life. These people will live forever. Amen. With every head by and every